On the podcast today, I sat down with two experts, Dr. Greg Grosicki and Dr. Jamie Pugh, who are experts in the field of gastrointestinal distress and the microbiome. Greg is a professor of kinesiology in the Department of Health Sciences and Kinesiology and is the director of the Exercise Physiology Laboratory and Biodynamics and Human Performance Center at Georgia South University Armstrong Campus. Jamie is a postdoctoral researcher and lecturer at Liverpool John Moores University. Separately, they have written seminal papers on the microbiome and probiotics in relationship to sport and exercise, and together are part of a research team conducting studies at huge events like the Western States Endurance Run and the Ironman World Championships in Kona. If you're going there, if you're going to be in Kona, hit these guys up. They're looking for subjects for an upcoming study. Today, we're going to dive in, though, to talk about the common culprits behind GI distress, how to troubleshoot those less than ideal moments, and what we currently know about the microbiome's influence on GI distress and endurance events. With that, I'll get right out of the way, and we can dive into our conversation. Jamie and Greg, welcome to the podcast. I would love to have you both introduce yourselves to our audience just so that people can start to pick out voices here as we dive into our conversation today. Awesome. Yeah. So maybe I'll kick off. Uh, so my name is Jamie Pugh. Uh, first, thank you so much for, for the invite, for coming on today. It's uh, it's awesome to, to come and, and chat with you. Um, I'm a researcher and a lecturer in Liverpool John Moores University in the, the UK. And for the past seven-ish years, I've been researching probiotics, the microbiome, and all of the factors uh, behind why endurance athletes in particular suffer from, from gut distress, essentially. Yeah, Corinne, thanks again. Uh, just echo Jamie's comments for having us on. I'm Greg Grosicki, an associate professor and scientist at Georgia Southern University, also director of the exercise physiology lab. I've been an endurance athlete since high school, really, when I started running cross country. And really the research on the gastrointestinal distress and probiotics and the microbiome is just the total um, kind of a mix of both my academic interests and my personal interests. So something that I'm very passionate about and love to love talking about. Yeah. And for those of you who don't know, because no one knows this, it's all behind the scenes. Um, I think we, we all canceled on each other at least once. <laughs> and so this has been a long time coming. But that's going to benefit everyone because I actually got to meet both Jamie and Greg at Western States not that long ago because they were conducting research there that we'll talk about a little bit today. Um, but to kick things off, I like to joke that when it comes to GI distress and endurance athletics and particularly running, for whatever reason, running, running definitely has a specific, um, I guess, affinity for GI distress, that there's two camps, the people who have experienced GI distress and people who have not yet experienced GI distress, that it's almost a given. And I would love to hear from both of you, like, why, why, why is this what you study? Why GI distress? Why the microbiome? What kind of kicked off those interests? Was it a personal experience that made you, <laughs> made you dive into this? Um, or kind of how did you end up in this, in this niche, in this niche field? Yeah, well, like you hit on, I've had a number of personal experiences as an endurance athlete where I find myself over there on the side of the road or in the woods. Uh, I think we all have. I actually got into studying the gastrointestinal tract by my postdoc where I looked at the relation between the bacteria and the microbes that live in our GI tract, which we refer to as the microbiota. And in the podcast, and if you look into the literature, you'll hear that referred to somewhat interchangeably as the microbiome, which really refers to their genetic material. But if you hear one or the other, we're talking about the same thing. Um, but anyway, we were looking at how those bacteria may contribute to the age-related loss of muscle mass. So totally different than what we just did at Western States and what I'm doing now. Um, but when I'm thinking about older adults and how they're losing muscle mass and how changes in the gut bacteria may relate to that, uh, kind of the first thing that comes to my mind as an athlete is, well, what effect does exercise have on those gut bacteria? And that's really how, where I'm at now. We know that as you get older, uh, a lot of physiological systems go downhill. And so we know exercise improves things, although it may not feel like it necessarily when we're out there at mile 20 of a marathon. Um, so I just wanted to know what is it that exercise does to the gut bacteria and how does it influence gastrointestinal distress? Jamie, anything similar for you there? Why, why did you end up in this, in this field <laughs> studying, say, studying us weird athletes? Yeah. And especially with the gut stuff and going around trying to collect, uh, fecal samples from, from individuals. Mine's, mine's a little bit different. Um, so that growing up, I, I pretty much played football or soccer. 
uh, to all the American listeners. So I came to, to athletics and running a little bit late. Um, and then it was a bit of a mix between, yeah, but personal experiences as well in that you, you sort of get these symptoms that you've never really had doing other sports. But at the same time, uh, my dad was actually diagnosed with an inflammatory bowel disease. So I was doing all of this side reading and research in the, the gut, trying to find out a few different things, but I'm, I'm no MD. I was always sports science. So eventually the opportunity came up to do this in, in an exercise physiology related capacity. And I just jumped in, um, managed to secure a PhD at the, the university that I still work at. And I've just been studying this, this side of things ever since it's just, um, it's been fascinating. And the more you look into it, the more you see that it seems to have a role in so many aspects of, of, health and performance so it's just been almost like a non-stop uh journey it just seems unlimited the places it could go and, and could lead to yeah there's definitely i think well when, as we touch on the microbiome more you know there's it's interconnected into so much of us as humans um which is pretty fat i teach anatomy and physiology as a long-term sub a bunch and we get to dive into these topics and watching high schoolers light up like finding these connections is i don't know maybe the best thing ever. Um, but as you mentioned, you know, both of your ex personal experiences kind of came predominantly when it when it turned towards athletics or running versus other sports. And we do we do pull in a bunch of cycling listeners because um, my co-host Adam Pulford is a cyclist um, by trade and for coaching. And so why might, you know, while GI distress does happen in some of these other endur endurance activities, why is running in particular such a such a hot spot for these issues to to crop up in a in a long event that where people might not, not have ever experienced it before. So part of my PhD was putting together some of the numbers behind this, and we did some some studies at some some marathon races, and it's crazy how disproportionate symptoms are in ultra marathon runners in particular compared to other sports. Um, the marathon is probably still only as comparable to like Ironman triathlon. So even if you look at some of the worst case scenarios, about a quarter of marathon runners and a quarter of Ironman triathletes seem to suffer from symptoms. You go up to ultra marathon, all of a sudden now you're talking about 70, 80, 90% of, of participants. Don't just say they suffer from symptoms, but say that it almost directly impacts their performance negatively. So it's not just a mild bit of gas or something like that. They're pulling out of races, it's slowing them down and just like ruining the experience essentially. So I think there's probably a lot of reasons why, um, the, the duration of the event, the fact that you have this jostling movement as you run compared to cycling where you, you, your body position is pretty, uh, pretty stationary. Some of these ultramarathon races are run at like really cool, but really challenging environments. So they could be in the heat, they can be at an altitude, like Western States is a great example, isn't it? You start at 2000 meters and at some point in the day, you could be running at like 35 degrees Celsius, which is a huge challenge. There aren't many other sports that you get that. Add in the fact then that you're chucking down maybe two, three, 400 calories an hour for that entire length of time. Um, and then the fact that it's like, it's a long time to go. So if you just think anyway, and I think some athletes struggle with this concept, if you're running in an event for 20 hours, you probably would have gone to the toilet in a normal 20 hour period anyway. So sometimes that side of things isn't unnatural. It's just that it's going to happen during a race and you might need to prepare for it. Yeah, I was leading a nutrition panel recently and one of the audience questions was simply what happens when you have to when you have to use the restroom <laughs> and the panel went dead silent and i had to kind of pick on someone to be like okay patty like take the question and he's like man i don't know like you just you got to do it yeah yeah and yeah so is there uh, it's a perfect storm is what it sounds like yeah as jamie touched on there's a lot of different factors happening within your body when you're doing exercise that are kind of creating this environment for gastrointestinal distress to get a little bit more but not too deep into the nitty-gritty one of the things that happens when you exercise is at rest you have a lot of blood going to your stomach and as a kid Right, you grow up and you always learn. I don't know why it's the pool, but everyone's always worried about it. Like it's like don't eat a couple hours before going to the pool because you'll get a stomach cramp. Maybe because if you cramp when you're swimming in the pool, bad things happen, right? Um, but then when we start exercising, this phenomenon happens in our body where all that blood that's going to our stomach and to digestion 
goes to our muscles. And, and so that, that creates this environment in the stomach where there's, there's no blood flow. And that, that, you know, that's pretty bad as is. And then as Jamie said, you add in the heat and that takes even more blood from our stomach to go elsewhere in our body. And so you have this crazy redistribution of blood that really creates this, again, perfect storm and then the jostling of the cycling. And um, some of the numbers that we just saw at Western States, so as you just touched on, we were there. We surveyed 43 athletes. We got a bunch of data. Wonderful athletes, by the way. Thank you so much. From them pre and post race, of the 43 athletes, 23 of them said that they had gastrointestinal distress severe enough to impact their race. And so some of those said that it was, you know, kind of moderate enough, but it did definitely slow them down 5 to 10%. 12 of them said it was very severe or extremely severe. And of the five or six in our study that we had drop out, I think four or five of them, so all but one of them dropped out of the study due to gastrointestinal distress. Another unique question that we added on, and I think it was actually one of the participants was talking to us before the race, and they were like, are you guys going to ask about how many times people vomit? And I was like, I didn't even think about that. We had people throwing up, and pooping 10 times or more during the race. Some people vomiting 20 or 30 times reported during these ultra marathons. So yeah, one or two times over the 20, 20 hours is normal. But when you have people, you know, pooping eight or 10 times over the course, that's, that's a serious concern. And even talking to them after some of them would send us emails and like, it's been three days and my stomach is still totally not right. You can barely take any food down. So it's certainly a really severe problem. Um, and the jaw, and we need, it needs to be studied more for sure. Yeah, I think that's really interesting to point out is that it's it's almost a norm. And I keep joking on this podcast that I'm really selling the sport of ultra running. <laughs> Someone's going to accidentally find this podcast for a different reason and and be like, why would anyone sign up and work to get into a race like Western States where I'm going to vomit 20 times? <laughs> um, it's definitely not not a good sales pitch. But what you guys highlighted there was that there's all these things that are almost that are that are related to the environment, to the conditions, to the nature of running for that long. Those are all things that, you know, we don't have a ton of control over, right? Like we don't, we can't control the weather despite our desires to, we can't control the fact that we're running a hundred miles because we signed up for it. Um, so what, those are things that we can't control, but what are the mistakes that athletes make in this environment that might lead them towards GI distress outside of those environmental conditions? Like what, what like what are those hangups that athletes have? Jamie, do you want to tell the story that Robbie talked about and from the supermarket the night before? <laughs> yeah, the I was going to say the the number one thing is is obvious. It's the nutrition, and you think how many athletes are meticulous in their training. They know how many miles they're going to go up each week, how many miles the long run's going to be, what paces to hit, and the nutrition is see it seems it's some for a lot of athletes still is like this afterthought. And we were speaking to to Robbie Britton, uh, and he was in one of the supermarkets literally the the Friday night before Western States. And he said there were two of the, the runners from the event in one of the aisles and they were deciding there and then what to have for dinner and maybe what were some of the things they should buy to eat during the race. And it's that's highlights one of the maybe more extreme ends of, of why people suffer. Um, like what goes in is going to have a huge impact on on how it's digested, how it's tolerated, what symptoms you get. So the biggest thing that people can do is is think about their nutrition, maybe work with a registered dietitian or sports nutrition and hit some of the basics and then practice it as well. Um, it's, you, it's not uh, so many runners that I speak to, they think they've practiced their nutrition because they maybe go out for a three or four hour run and they have a couple of gels and then they get to the race and all of a sudden it's, no, I need to, I'm slamming down liters of fluid every couple of hours i'm taking gel after gel or i'm grabbing foods from the the crew stations that i've never eaten before um like you can't obviously practice 16 hours worth of nutrition but you can certainly plan for it and have your a plan your b plan your c plan of foods that you might um filter down through maybe when you feel a bit nauseous you're sick of sweet sensations or you're sick of salty sensations but having a plan for nutrition is, is the biggest thing. Equally with the hydration strategy, as much as hypernutremia is probably something that's on a lot of people's minds, so the overconsumption of fluids, it is a balancing act where you can't just ignore it because dehydration also has 
a huge role to play in nausea and vomiting, especially if you're severely dehydrated, that is going to have a huge, uh, huge influence on, on the development of those symptoms. Greg, anything to add to that as far as like common mistakes you see out there with athletes? Yeah, I think Jamie hit the nail on the head that it's practicing and, and not only to see what works for you, because it's not going to be the same for every person, right? Um, I just anecdotally in my personal experience, uh, during half Ironmans, I could be totally fine on just, uh, like sports drink and, and gels, energy gels, goos, I'd be totally fine. And I'd get into an Ironman and it'd be about six hours onto the run. It didn't matter how many calories I had had. If I hadn't chewed something, even so simple as a sports block, I would just come totally unwound. And, and some people can do all of Western States just on, just on sports drink. And so I think practicing to see what works for you, but also something that we've learned over the past couple of years, just from a scientific perspective is that the gut is also extremely trainable. And I don't think people think about the gastrointestinal tract like that. when they think about it, that much like skeletal muscle, the gut can be taught to take in more calories during racing. And so as an endurance coach, when I'm working with my athletes, I have them many months before we even do whatever Ironman we're doing, it's like, listen, now the research is showing that you might be able to take in 100 grams an hour on the bike. And so we're going to go for that. And you're going to do that in your training session. And if it works for you, then you're going to do it during the race because we want to get as many calories in you as we can. And as an endurance coach, I'm, I'm not a nutritionist. I'm not an RD. I'm not a, so, so I don't try to confuse myself with that. But, but I think people need to learn that it, if at first it may not be super comfortable, but the gut is trainable. And so learning that it's adaptable and, and, and that, you know, you want to practice like you play is, is really the simple matter of it. Yeah, you're right. We, we find athletes just kind of throw it away, right, on race day when it comes to nutrition, that they've invested a lot of time and money into this activity, into this race, and then to, to kind of waste it because you didn't want to eat on your long run or you didn't want to, you know, practice the fact that you – thought you were going to take potato chips and Coke at the aid station and you've never done that yeah. before. Or the fact that pretzels are really dry at mile 60 of Leadville and maybe you don't want pretzels. Um, so I think it's important to, you're right, that practice does seem to be the biggest thing there. I'm curious, you know, if athletes are getting into a race, like any, I mean, any endurance, any endurance activity and they've, they've made a mistake, something's going sideways, right? They are vomiting or they've got diarrhea or something is not, not good. They're hiding in the bushes, let's say on Cal street somewhere. What can they do to correct that? Is there a correction or are they just going to kind of have to like, you know, w walk it in type of thing as far as like getting back on track when you've, when you've pushed your body to that extreme? That's a tough one. I think finding ways to cool themselves down. So I certainly don't think trying to push through it is going to be of any help. We talked about one of the, you know, physiological factors at play here it being heat. And so in the heat, this is very commonly experienced. And so, if you're trying to exercise at a high intensity or you're, or you're exercising when it's extremely hot, trying to cool oneself down and then get some of that blood flow back to the, back to the GI tract um, certainly might be helpful. Certainly pushing through uh, probably is good. I mean, it depends where you are, right? You're very close to the finish maybe, but, but if you, there's a long road ahead, um, I think it can maybe even do more harm than good. Any ideas, Jamie? Yeah, I was going to say it's one that – I'm going to assume that people have got a good plan and a good strategy in place already. And if that's the case, then try your best to continue with that. Ideally, you need a contingency plan as well. So your your taste preference can change, something like that. But the worst thing you can do is stop eating, stop drinking, switch to water only because you can't tolerate anything else anymore. Um, stick to the plan as much as you can. Or, like I said, fall back to the contingency. And don't go to extreme so don't now cut everything out and at the same time don't try and compensate for maybe some of the things that you've lost because that can make symptoms worse or give you other symptoms if you think oh no i've just lost 400 calories in vomit or i've just spewed up a uh, half a liter of flu fluid the worst thing you can do then is think i need to replace all of that and get it down as quickly as i can because you're just going to flood the system again you're going to fill the stomach completely you're going to saturate all of the transporters in the in the small intestine and you're just going to create new problems for yourself or make the problems that you've got already that little bit worse so assuming that you have a good plan already um because maybe it might be the plan that you you went into the race 
a whip that's got you there in that first place. But if your plan is smart and it's just one of those things that's crept up, the conditions have got to you, you've ran a little bit too hard, um, the effort's been a little bit too high for what you could do that day, um, just just fall back to the plan, reassess, and, uh, and just try and, and stay as sensible as possible. Yeah, that troubleshooting can become really important. And those contingency plans, I think, are maybe what's going to save someone's day if they've gotten themselves into a bit of trouble um, at any race, be it Western States or something different. So I think what I would love to talk about now is, so why, like, how'd you guys end up at Western States? Why, like, why of all, of all the people you could be studying, why did you choose a bunch of ultra runners in California, um, in a super hot race? And then maybe, you know, kind of talk about, um, not only the methodology, but kind of like the, like the question you're trying to get at with this research. And then we can kind of go, go from there. So that all started back in uh, 2018, probably fall of 2018. Patrick Reagan and I were sitting in my front yard drinking uh, a bunch of beers and, and chatting about his race plan for the, I, I probably shouldn't have said his name. That's all right. Um, he won't mind. And talking about his race calendar for the 2019 year. And I had just met, I had just moved to Savannah. We became friends and he's like, yeah, you know, got this Western States race. And as, as a triathlete, I was familiar with the ultra running community, but I, um, I, I didn't know it super well, but I had certainly heard of Western States. I was like, oh, that sounds pretty rad. And I was looking at it more and I, and I was doing some research on exercise in the gut microbiome. And I was chatting with Pat and it kind of just came, I'm like, hey man, I got these extra collection kits. I was like, what do you say we have, we have a go with this? And so we started studying him actually in February. And this is a collaboration with um, his coach that year, which is Magdalena Boulay at Goo Energy and, and Roxanne Vogel, their sports nutritionist. And they kind of pushed Pat. Um, he was, he was going to do the race and, and, you know, they were, he was kind of iffy about getting into the physiology lab and they're like, listen, you need to go get tested in, in, uh, in Greg's lab. So he came in and then he was all on board. We were really excited about it. He has an undergrad in he uh, health and exercise science. So once we started getting in and I was showing him his VO2 max data and all this other stuff. He got really excited about it. And so over the course, basically from February until two weeks after Western States, we studied him. We did a whole bunch of VO2 max and running economy and lactate threshold and DEXA scans for body comp. Basically just, you know, what is what is he like as a, as a physical specimen? Um, and uh, we also studied his, his the bacteria in his gut, the gut microbiome at four time points. So we wanted to see how are those bacteria changing, if at all, as he gets ready for the race? In February, he was kind of training, running like 30 or 40 miles a week, but certainly not like peak training. Um, so we studied him in February. We studied him before the race, um, kind of like we did at Western States this year. And then um, one of the you know interesting things about microbiome research is it's not like drawing blood or collecting saliva or even urine where you can kind of collect it whenever you want. It's uh, the sample comes when it comes, right? And so... Um, we were able to get a sample two hours after the race, thanks to a grad student. Just kidding, Pat actually collected it. And, and, then, and then we got another sample two weeks later um, to look at how his microbiome changed during the race and then how it recovered. And we saw some uh, really no changes in his gut microbiome as he was getting ready for the race. But after the race, we saw some pretty profound and rapid changes that we thought were pretty exciting and were relating to some other things that were being reported in the scientific literature, specifically uh, ways to enhance his performance by giving him more fuel when he was running, just changes in bacteria that were they were doing that. Um, and, and so we published that paper in, in December of 2019. Uh, it picked up a good amount of traction. And, and then uh, it kind of fell a bit dormant, that research uh, area, until uh, Matt Lay and I were actually chatting on a podcast, uh, one of Ian Sherman's podcasts during COVID, and, and Matt and I were both you know, uh, bemoaning how, you know, academia was closed and we were just chatting about the microbiome and the cool research we had done on it. And uh, Jamie heard it, heard it overseas, like almost six months later and reached out to Matt and I, and he's like, wow, this is a super cool study. Um, I have some funding to do some microbiome research. Do you guys have any ideas? And Matt and I said, boy, do we have some ideas. Um, and so that's kind of where this all came from. Uh, Jamie and Matt and a couple other researchers, uh, uh, Jacob Allen at the University of Illinois and Jimmy Bagley at San Francisco State have been chatting about a couple projects they were doing this year for almost a year and a half now. Um, and so that's kind of where the Western States thing came from. That's so that's so exciting. Okay, so you we've mentioned you had 43 
um, volunteers. I always call them subjects. I'm like, that's kind of mean. We'll call them volunteers um, at Western States, including like, and, and that was additional to, you also had controls. Is that correct? So you had a little bit, a little bit more than that to look at. What did that look like for those, those volunteers run it like, running Western states, what were you trying to collect? And then kind of what information came out, uh, loosely has come out of that, obviously. That's something that's still, that you guys are still working on, but kind of what takeaways are, are have you seen thus far from, from that research? Yeah, so we are really lucky. The Western States Endurance Research Board um, gave us some funding and supported us in doing this. What's so cool is they sent out one email and it wasn't even at the top of the email, it was at the bottom of the email. And we had 43 athletes literally come up to us and do this study totally for free, which I just think, you know, shows uh, the, of the goodwill uh, of this community and like their interest in science. And we'd be chatting with these people and they'd be, you know, PhDs and MDs. And we're like, man, you guys are way better at doing our jobs than even we are. So it was really incredible getting to, to network and, and chat with these athletes. We had 43 um, athletes. And so before the race, uh, two weeks before the race, approximately, they filled out a survey. They basically told us their life story in here um, from very basic things like height and weight to their medical history, medications they take, what their training looked like going into Western, what foods they eat, um, how much they slept, uh, all the things we know that can influence the gut microbiome and can also influence gastrointestinal distress questions on things like, you know, fermented foods and kombucha and, and everything that we thought might influence it. Um, then we met up with all of them uh, the week of Western, and they gave them basically collection kits. And so they all collected a sample, uh, a stool sample within 48 hours of the race start, and then ideally the first bowel movement after the race. And as of today, I just looked, literally every single one of their samples has made it to our lab at Illinois, Jacob's lab. It's incredible. Like, it's so cool that they took the, I mean, they went to you, they all collected the samples, went to UPS, mailed them in. Um, and so we're, we're, that data is going to take some time um, before we get it all analyzed, but we're really excited about looking into that. They also filled out surveys post-race. And so we have an idea as to what they actually ate when they were doing the race, um, what their gastrointestinal, uh, you know, health status looked like, um, how many times they pooped and how many times they vomited during the race. Um, you know, what role heat and their GI distress played into their race. And so overall, you know, the kind of global purpose of this study is just to get a better understanding of how those bacteria in our gut relate to gastrointestinal distress and just performance during the race. And then if we can figure that out, can we use some of the information that we got from these people going in and try to design targeted really strategies, therapeutic strategies or interventions to minimize that? So maybe we see something like, the people who weren't sleeping very well, um, they had more GI distress. And so that could be a very evidence-based recommendation. Listen, the people who were sleeping better had a better gut microbiome and they had less GI distress during the race. Or um, maybe the people who were sticking with a certain food, um, a certain medicine, um, all things like that. Jamie, I, I know you have some things you could add on here. Yeah, I was going to say, just to, to echo some of those early thoughts in that, like, how cool is, is Western States as a race to turn up and, and do studies at? We, you think we managed, so from that 40, we actually managed to get, Greg, correct me if I'm wrong, I think four of the top 10 males and four of the top 10 females. And then when you think we've also got athletes all the way through that finished in that final hour, there aren't many other sports or events in the world where you could go and get the elite of the elite and then also people doing this recreationally. So we've got some some really cool data, uh, some really cool participants in the study. Um, I suppose from what we can hopefully get from the data is is maybe one of two things. Maybe we can see, okay, if we look at an individual's microbiome at baseline, and we've, we've not just looked at the bacteria, but we've also looked at all of the, the metabolites in, in the stool samples as well. So that are things like glucose and uh, different fatty acids, lactate, hormones, different proteins. So maybe it's that what an individual's uh, gut looks like before the race, maybe that can predict um, the, the chances of them suffering from GI issues during the race. Or maybe what we see is that there's no prediction early on, but what we see is that these symptoms lead to these huge changes post-race. Um, microbiome research is really tough in that you're trying to analyze potentially thousands of different bacterial species so it's not like 
blood glucose where you look at this one marker and measure it over time you're trying to to assess all of the these bacteria and then make a best guess of okay which ones of these are important to make it more complicated i imagine if we took microbiome samples from all three of us we would probably have species that the others don't as well so we're not even always comparing the same thing we're comparing a community of bacteria but maybe all of us have got a completely different community so that's um it makes it difficult it makes it complicated it makes it fun to study but it also means that this research could be step four of a five-step process or it means it could be step one of a 20-step process and um it's why we need to try and do more and more of these types of types of studies it'd be great to see this data we've got some some more studies lined up and um hopefully we can get some recommendations and hopefully it sort of leads into and informs of okay what do we need to look out for next time how can we tweak things to get a better understanding yeah i feel like a lot oftentimes good studies just prompt more questions um but i do think it's really cool that of the 40 some participants that you did really have a whole spread of the field because i think that is oftentimes like a limitation in these studies it's like well the results only allow us to make recommendations for this population and this is once again i mean it's a weird population but it's a broad population of people amongst kind of at least performance times um so while the microbiome is basically like a fingerprint. I feel like it's there are trends in communities, particularly yeah. people who live in the same region um, and do some of the same things. But it's you know linked to diet and all you know to everything you touch. Yeah. Um, and so I'm wondering, you know, with some of those broad recommendations, is there you know is there a hope that this leads to recommendations about about diet, about lifestyle, about supplements, about like you know probiotics and prebiotics and that kind of thing? Like what is the what is the hope of be this step four or five or step one of a thousand. Yeah, that's certainly the overall goal. And and just one of the things, sorry, to go back to touch on the thing Jamie talked about is how um, it's always changing as well and even throughout the day. And so that's one of the things we tried to do that had never really been done before is there's a paper that came out just earlier this year that showed like taking a sample in the morning and taking a sample at night could be totally different. And so we had 43 athletes, but we also had 10 controls who followed uh, essentially the same diet. I think without exercising, I ate nine booze and drunk three bottles of octane, two stroop waffles, 55 goldfish, 17 pretzels, two red vines, and a banana. Uh, not and so not that that's ingrained in your memory who, for life. Who who came up with the the proposed diet for the controls? Who what what whose job? Uh, is I that? have to take credit for that one. Um, okay. Good. They, we know who to we know who to send yeah, complaints five, to. Yeah, five of the people big. were other researchers who didn't really have a choice, and then we had five <laughs> people who good Samaritans. And I apologize. But hopefully, the good news is once we have that standardized, how much does it change just when you eat that diet? We hopefully won't have to do it too much again. So, um, yeah. But yeah, so so we'll be looking at that too. But certainly, the eventual goal is, is something uh, very applied. And I think that dovetails really nicely into Jamie has done some fantastic work, uh, really um, kind of seminal looking at uh, probiotics. And there are a lot of other strategies we can use. We have a study um, we're currently recruiting for at the Ironman World Championships in Kona, Hawaii. And so I'll let Jamie talk a little bit about his probiotic research that he's done previously in the lab and then what we're going to do next. Yes, so like Greg said, then as you were alluding to a little bit, the overall goal is to find something that we can then try and modify. So either we stop something bad from happening at the end of the race, or if there's if there are these characteristics pre-race that may be protective, can we promote them leading into it through diet or some intervention? Um, we we've certainly carried out. We certainly carried out uh, two or three studies uh, in our lab looking at probiotic supplementation. Um, so one of the ones that we did is we got a group of uh, marathon runners to supplement either with a probiotic or a, a placebo. So double blinded, nobody knew what they were taking. We didn't know what they were taking. And they tracked their, their symptoms during training for four weeks. And then we got them to, to run a marathon race, uh, but we hosted it ourselves so we could control everything. And we essentially, we did it around an athletics track. So it was like 105 plus a bit laps. 
But what it meant was that we did it right outside the exercise physiology lab that was at the university. We took muscle biopsy samples, we took blood samples, and it also meant that we could standardize the nutrition as well. So it wasn't um, like a field-based study as such, where you just let people do what they want. We made all of the participants carb load in the same way the day before the race. We made them have all of the same breakfast. We had a, a big pay, PA system during the race that I would go on and I would say, right, it's 20 minutes, everybody has to have a drink, everybody has to have the gel. And so it was completely standardized. And what we found in that was that uh, what you see in all, all running-based sports, so early on there were next to no GI symptoms, and then for every runner, or most runners, as the race went on, symptoms progressively got worse. So they rated their, their gut symptoms worse and worse as the race went on. Those in the probiotic group, it didn't seem to change between the sort of the second third and the final third of the race. So it was attenuated a little bit. And I, I'd always caveat, caveat this by saying it didn't completely alleviate the symptoms at all. Like we still had runners in the probiotic group who reported symptoms. We still had athletes in the probiotic group that reported symptoms during training as well. But they certainly seem to be uh, less severe and less frequent than the the placebo group. So there seems to be some sort of protective uh, effect there. So which is why we want to try and take this out now to Kona and see can we measure the the same effect in a in a larger sample and and out in the field. Yeah, and they'll they'll be in adverse conditions and they'll have a bunch of other issues out there as well. I'm guess I guess you know this is probably a question that might not have a good answer, but do we understand or have any ideas about like the mechanism behind why something like that might be protective? So there could be a few. The, some of the the stuff that we're working on currently in our lab is can probiotics increase uh, our ability to absorb and use carbohydrates that we consume during exercise itself. So we've done uh, two lab-based studies where we fed cyclists and then in the second study runners uh, 90 grams of carbohydrates an hour. We've then looked, uh, we can use traces essentially to measure how much of that drink are they actually using, how much is being absorbed, goes to the muscle, oxidized and, and used. And we found that after they take, after participants take probiotics, they're using more of the drink, they're absorbing more and using it more effectively. That could be one of the mechanisms. That's one, the one that we've been looking at. There are others. Um, so Greg touched on the fact that when we exercise, less blood goes to the gut. One of the things it does is, is slow down digestion, but it also causes um, a little bit of damage to some of the cells. So some of the cells like can essentially burst or they can die, and this can cause a little bit of inflammation. This is, in Western states especially, this is one of the, the seminal uh, studies that have done this, they found that that damage and that inflammation is one of the factors that leads to nausea in particular during the later stages of race. So maybe probiotics or other foods as well, maybe there are other things that you can do to, to protect that and lessen that damage as the the race goes on so that's one of the things we've not studied but others have, have looked at some of that as well there was a study that came out recently and this is a, not i would say it's adjacent it's not tangential that looked at iron absorption with the co-ingestion of symbiotics so like a prebiotic probiotic combination and actually it seemed to increase the absorption of iron in that test group. I think it was a pretty yeah. small test group, which is not uncommon in exercise physiology research. But I thought that was really interesting. And that like to me, I was like, oh, is this the is this one of those mechanisms, right? Where you just have this increased absorption capacity and is that, you know, is there are there links there maybe? Or at least it, there's there seems to be like a trend of, of what that mechanism and might be. Sure. But really oh, I think it's, it's a great theory. point. Because a lot of it has to do with what bacteria are there, right? And what are those bacteria doing? Um, Steve Henniger at Florida State just published a very similar paper, and he might have been on this one as well because he's pretty um, big in this field, showing that after a run, like a really hard distance run, iron absorption was reduced in a cohort, I believe it was of male runners. And so that a lot has to do with the inflammation, but all that has to do, at least to some extent, with what bacteria are there. If you look at data from people with irritable bowel disease and inflammatory colitis, and I think that's one of the other kind of bigger picture goals of our research platform is that when you get some of these athletes, um, you know, especially after doing something like Western States, where they're literally telling us, you know, my, I've like been literally curled up in bed for three days. It's very similar to these clinical conditions. And so I think we can learn a lot 
from these athletes about helping clinical states as well. But what we see when we look at the gut microbiome of these people is a very, what they refer to in the literature as a dysbiotic gut microbiome. So there's this proliferation of all these pathogenic bacteria and pathogenic microbes that create this inflammatory state and lead to this gastrointestinal distress. And conversely, they also have a reduction in some of the good bacteria and good bugs, bacteria that produce things like short chain fatty acids, which is a metabolite that we're measuring that's anti-inflammatory. And so kind of using therapeutic intervention, whether it be probiotics or, 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 or kombucha or um, fermented foods or fiber to optimize the, the, the balance and the intestinal milieu if we can uh, as a therapeutic strategy for racers when they're going into a race or someone with a clinical condition to increase iron absorption or improve carbohydrate metabolism. It's kind of all really under the same umbrella in a way. And this is one of the areas, though, that, that essentially we've gone into one of the hardest areas of research for sports nutrition because we can take blood from people, we can take muscle from people. One of the things that we can't do is go and take samples from, from the gut. So we, we're collecting stool samples, but that's that's the end product of this long, long process that can take like a day or two days. So what we can't do is measure, okay, what happens in the small intestine when most of this absorption goes on? So what you end up with is lots of studies where you have input uh, in some way. So you might have some intervention that the only thing we can do is measure the output. And then the black box in the middle is just this mystery. We just have to make our best guesses or look at different models to try and see, okay, what, what, why might that be working? And one of the things we're doing too is asking the athletes to actually time point when after the race the sample is taken. So hopefully by figuring more about that and then integrating that with like machine learning, we might be able to try to find how the microbiome not only changes after the race, but what does the evolution um, of that look like? And obviously for that, we're going to need some uh, to enlist the assistance of some people who are, are, are experts in that field. But yeah, um, lots of things to answer there. I was going to say transit time becomes a big, uh, a big issue with uh, field studies in this, in this realm you, for we were, sure, um, um, or at least predicting. We were doing little time. blood samples after the race and it was like four in the morning and I went up to a guy who had just finished, he was like super tired, right? Um, I think you were back taking a nap at this point, Jamie. We were trading off all night. And I was pretty tired as well. And I went up to him, he was he was exhausted. I'm like, hey man, like, can I get the sample? <laughs> and I, I meant like the blood sample, right? And his crew was looking at me, they're like, what are you gonna do, just take it out of And I was like, no, 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 just talking about the blood sample. <laughs> no. <laughs> wearing the gloves and everything, right? Like, no, no, I just meant the blood. <laughs> That's too funny. Yeah, we did a study. We were using um, temperature temperature pills for a, a ultra in Vancouver, and I had to convince the PI that if we made them eat it the night before, like consume it the night before, half the pills were not going to make yeah. it to yeah. the race course. And he was convinced otherwise that transit time could not be that fast. And I was like, no, man. <laughs> you never like, met a runner. <laughs> these pills are not making it to the race course. If you, yeah, like you, you don't know what's going to happen race morning. Um, Okay, so what I guess, you know, obviously the microbiome is a mystery in some way. I feel like there's a lot of really cool research in this realm. You all are very much a huge part of that. Is there any, like, common recommendations that we can give to people confidently right now about what they can do in their day-to-day -day lives to try to promote, you know, to put their best foot forward in a way when it comes to their gut health and to their microbiome? Mine are always really boring, and I always feel like there should be something more cutting edge and, and really worry, interesting and cool. Like, if you, you've got to hit the basics first, and that's you've got to be hitting lots of fruits and vegetables. You've got to have a varied diet, consuming uh, yeah, a wide variety of foods. If they're seasonal, fantastic. You don't have to shy away from from some of the foods that tend to get a, a bad rap, you don't have to completely avoid the the diet drinks and the artificial sweeteners and things like that. I'm not saying over consume them, but by all means you don't have to avoid them completely. There's no good evidence in, in humans especially that these things are very negative. Um, other than that, it's, it's lots, that's most, I, I, from my point of view, that would be it from the diet. Like if you want to try a probiotic, if you want to try fermented foods, great there's again no um, there's no amazing research that these are completely transformative you're going to see 
small benefits on top, potentially. Um, beyond that, in day-to-day -day life and then particularly uh, in and around exercise, you're going to want to avoid some of the things that can have a, a big negative impact on the gut microbiome and then gut health in general. Um, so maybe some of the medications. Like Western States is great in that part of the medical briefing now is do not take ibuprofen, do not take non steroidal anti-inflammatories during the race. And that's such a good recommendation that should just be echoed at the start of every ultra marathon race. We know they can have a, a big, big negative impact on the gut uh, and lead to lots of symptoms. Antibiotics, obviously, if you have to take a course of antibiotics, you have to take a course of antibiotics. But maybe that's a, a time point afterwards that you really need to be to be on it. That's when you're going to be at a much greater risk of suffering from an infection or from diarrhea, something like that. So you really need to look after yourselves at some of those times as well. Greg, come on, I want to hear some of your more exciting recommendations now that I've uh, I've laid yeah. down the boring ones. You, you, no, you crushed it. Um, there was a really cool study, actually, um, and I don't know if you guys listen to the Huberman Lab podcast, but there's another really good episode with Andrew Huberman and Justin Sonnenberg who is at Stanford, and, and they chatted about one of Justin's crowdfund studies where they compared um, uh, dietary fiber to fermented foods. So fiber is coming in a lot of those fruits and veggies that uh, Jamie touched on, and they actually showed superior adaptations um, with – which one was it now? Now I brought it up, and now I can't even remember which one it was. Um, it's one or the other, and now you have to go listen to another podcast to find to find yeah, the actual know. answer. That's that's yeah, the that point. might be the, that might be the worst advice on a podcast ever. Go and listen to this other podcast. Thanks, Jamie. I appreciate it. <laughs> At least it's very close to the end. Right? Um, I believe it was the fermented foods were more effective, but I could be I could be wrong there. Um, you got a you had a fifty fifty chance of getting that right, I was and we super don't confident know if you when did. I started talking about it. And I but this is but, but this but, yeah, probably yeah, highlights yeah. one of the issues doesn't it that it doesn't have to be one or the other as well and i think some people get really hooked on some of this like if you if you like fermented foods great if you if you like one of them or great. two of them fantastic but if it's not going to be such a huge benefit that if you don't like kombucha if you if you can't afford to be going buy all the commercial stuff all the time you can't you don't have the time to to ferment some of these things yourself then you can still get lots of benefits from fruits and vegetables and vice versa. Like the ideal thing is you, you maybe get a little bit of both. It was, it was the fermented foods and not fiber, by the way. I was right. Yeah. Oh, we Googled it real fast. That's good. <laughs> that, yeah, I was yeah, buying nice in time. I thought if I talk long enough, can he Google it? I could. No, <laughs> no the fermented foods. Anything, anything else to add to that, Greg? Beyond, is, beyond. Uh, is that? One that people don't think about. So a lot of things that we do, from like a physical activity perspective can influence it. Our lab and many others have showed um, cross-sectional associations between both self-reported and actigraphy-derived uh, sleep and the gut microbiome and people who have um, on kind of the other end of the spectrum, like a obstructive sleep apnea, exhibit a very dysbiotic gut microbiome. And so that's one that I think a lot of endurance athletes in particular uh, a lot of us wake up at four or five in the morning a lot because we have to work and that's when we have to get up to get our training in. And I mean, anecdotally, I can tell you that the mornings when I, or when, the long stretches of training when I'm, um, you know, maybe really trying to train a lot and not getting enough sleep, I feel like I get maybe the most GI distress and that's no coincidence. So I think sleep may be um, the novel one, probably the most novel one that, uh, that Jamie didn't touch on. Another one is just, um, probably avoiding avoiding changing our diet when we go to the race. Uh, at Ironman World Championships in Kona, we're going to be lucky enough to get a sample at the athlete's house as well as 48 hours before race start. And every time athletes go to Kona, they're devouring pokey and eating yogurt. So a whole bunch of uh, you know different bacteria probably getting into their gut. And changing it right before the race is certainly not going to probably create a very um, you know great environment. So things like that as well being regular yeah it turns out it's like doing all the simple things right it's like you know it's it's yes you can buy the expensive things but it turns out it's like the eating a good diet and getting enough sleep and i've been reading studies recently about like oral health and and dental yeah. stuff because I, because of my root canal <laughs> recently and it turns out that like 
good oral health is predictive of better performance. Yeah. And I was like, okay, I will floss more if I will run Here, faster. Here's one for I'm you. Flossing. Using mouthwash may actually be deleterious to your performance. Because you have not only a microbiome in your gut, but you have one on your skin and in your oral cavity. So basically in your mouth. And you have specific bacteria there that convert dietary nitrate to nitrite, which can then be metabolized to nitric oxide, which can be extremely important for exercise. So sticking away from mouthwash and uh, chewing too much gum can actually get rid, deplete those microbes in your oral cavity. If people have made it this far into the podcast, their lives just got changed <laughs> just a little bit. Okay. Um, to not keep you both too much longer, because we could definitely talk for a very long time about some nonsense and some really good science. Um, where if people are really interested in this, um, where should we direct them? Where, where can they find you? Um, if they, you don't want them in their inbox or in your inbox, is there somewhere else that they can, they can reach out to you? Is that Twitter? Um, if you guys can just both plug yourself, that would be wonderful. Um, so yeah, feel free to reach out on email. It's just my, uh, first initial, my first name G and then last name Grosicki, G R O S I C K I at Georgia Southern edu. Um, also on Twitter and Instagram, it's just at, uh, D R Greg Grosicki, G R O S I C K I. Um, yeah, happy to respond to any inquiries you guys have. Yeah. And the same, like more than happy for people to, to email and get in touch. Like we, we wouldn't be here sat together. Me and Greg, we wouldn't have done this study if it wouldn't have been for just random emails out of the blue. So, um, for my, for my email, it's j.pew at ljmu.ac.uk, as in Liverpool John Moores University. Uh, Twitter, it's pew underscore Jamie. Uh, people can follow me on Instagram if, if they want, but they might see like one story every few months. They might see the occasional picture of, of me and my wife. <laughs> but if they're interested in the science stuff, then the Twitter is probably the one to go for. Wonderful. I will link uh, the Twitter feeds into our show notes for everyone as well so they can reach out to you there. I want to thank you both for giving me so much of your time today, orchestrating the time zones and everyone's busy lives. Um, I hope people got a lot out of this. Oh, thank you so much for the invite. And um, yeah, thank you.